Hello, I am Elizabeth Mitchell, Interim Co-Director of the Cantor Arts Center, and welcome to this evening's special virtual tour of the Cantor's exhibition, When Home Won't Let You Stay, Migration Through Contemporary Art. Our tour tonight will be led by Maggie Detloff, the Cantor Arts Center's Assistant Curator of Photography and New Media. I'd like to thank Maggie for all of her incredible work over the past months and congratulate her and the entire Cantor team on presenting this fascinating and thought-provoking exhibition. We also are happy that the museum will be opening to the public tomorrow. And all the information you need to plan your in-person visit is available on the museum's website. However, we will continue to offer programming virtually for the foreseeable future, including all programs related to When Home Won't Let You Stay. This exhibition is organized by Ruth Erickson, the Mannion Family Curator, and Eva Respini, the Barbara Lee Chief Curator, with Annie Pulagura, Curatorial Assistant, from the Institute of Contemporary Art, Boston. The Cantor Arts Center's presentation is organized by Maggie Detloff, Assistant Curator for Photography and New Media, and Jessica Ventura, Curatorial Assistant. We gratefully acknowledge support from the Halperin Exhibition Fund, and we are also grateful for the support of our members. Your generosity enables the museum to share these profound and compelling digital art experiences. And if you're not a member and you would like to learn more, please click on the link in the chat. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Maggie. Hi everybody, thank you so much for being here with me tonight. I'm really thrilled to be here to give you this special focused tour of the three multi-channel video works in When Home Won't Let You Stay. I'm also thrilled that as of tomorrow, you'll be able to come and see them in person. As Elizabeth mentioned, uh, we will continue to do virtual events. And actually this gives us a really exceptional opportunity when it comes to media works because it's often quite difficult to do in-person tours of media works because of their uh, loud volume, because of a lack of time, and because of dim uh, theater spaces. We've had this exhibition available for virtual viewing for a few months now, but you may have noticed that these media works were not reproduced in full online, and this is for many reasons. So this event gives us an opportunity to do something that we weren't able to do uh, as a standalone thing on our website. And it gives us an opportunity to do something that we're um, not easily able to do in person. So I'll be showing you today the artworks in situ in our Matterport 3D virtual tour. I'll be showing you video clips of the work and I'll be showing you several still photographs of the works in the galleries and a kind of hybrid tour and talk that will allow us to finally dig into these absolutely fantastic works. Um, please keep yourself muted during the tour. If you have questions, you can drop them in the chat. If I can address them in the moment, I will. Um, if it's something I can't address in the moment, I'll answer them during the time reserved for Q&A at the end. And during the Q&A portion, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask your question if you prefer that way. So. Our current exhibition, When Home Won't Let You Stay, considers how contemporary artists are responding to the unprecedented amounts of migration, immigration, and displacement of people all over the world today. The show highlights the diverse responses of 18 international artists, and it's organized around several overlapping themes, exploring ideas of home, identity and belonging, sites and modes of transit, and provisional structures like borders and refugee camps. All the artworks in the exhibition tell stories of migration and it's important to consider who is telling these stories and how they're telling them. These three artworks, although created ostensibly in the same medium, multi-channel video installations, they're made by artists of different subjectivities who have utilized time-based media, moving image and audio, to tell stories from very different perspectives. Those perspectives, as I would describe them, are the poetic, the personal, and the political. We'll discuss the three artworks in the order in which you encounter them in the galleries. And this will be a tight choreographed dance between many different shared screens. So uh, bear with me. All right. So 
So we start with the poetic in Isaac Julian's Western Union Small Boats. Here we are in the middle of Freedom Ridge Gallery in our Matterport tour, about to head into the theater that we built for this work. You can see um, for this three channel video, which you'll be able to see as soon as I swivel, Isaac Julian filmed on the islands of Sicily and Lampedusa off the coast of the Italian peninsula, which has been a significant historic and contemporary landing point for migrants um, going between the Middle East and Europe, Africa and Europe, and um, all points thereabouts. You can see Julian has emphasized the centrality of the sea to these migrants' voyage and the island setting of their arrival in the rich blue of the theater walls and carpet. So now we're gonna watch a short clip of the work, which you can also watch here in Matterport on your own time. So Western Union Small Boats is about the so-called clandestine immigrants, that is immigrants making the journey illegally um, between North Africa and Europe, who at the time the work was made in 2007 had been coming by the thousands to places like Sicily and Lampedusa for some time looking for work. At the beginning of that clip, we saw a group of clandestines making their journey in one of the small boats of the artwork title, ubiquitous at the time as the kind of boat in which so many migrants made their precarious journey across the Mediterranean. However, not everyone made it across safely. And newspapers at the time were not only showing images of migrants in small boats, but also scenes of, for instance, corpses washed ashore wrapped in silver foil on the beach like this image here, which you saw in the clip. Importantly, these aren't documentary images in Isaac Julian's work though. They're tableau vivants, reconstructions or reworkings of scenes that Julian saw in the media. The men in the boat are indeed a group of clandestines, clandestines, but the scene is a cinematic recreation of their journey. The bodies under foil here in this scene, um, are actually the bodies of dancers. In the scenes in Western Union, these foil blanket covered bodies are jarringly juxtaposed with scenes of tourists enjoying the very beach onto which we would assume these bodies had washed up. 
Julian weaves these kinds of tableau vivants throughout the film, interspersed with choreographed scenes of the dancers, introducing elements of the poetic and artistic in an effort to combat compassion fatigue, that numbness to tragedy that we may get when we see violent or grisly images in the news too often. So let's watch another short clip foregrounding the dancers. So the scenes in this clip were filmed in the Palazzo Gang, uh, Ganji, excuse me, in the city of Palermo on the island of Sicily. This palazzo was earlier a filming location for the 1963 film by Lucino Visconti called The Leopard, itself adapted from a 1958 novel of the same name by Giuseppe de Lampedusa about the waning of 19th century Sicilian aristocracy at the moment of Sicilian Italian unification. Julian draws a parallel between the transitional moment in The Leopard and the transitional moment that was unfolding at the time of making this work, suggesting a through line through Sicilian history of economic class dynamics and waves of migration both into and out of Sicily. In addition to the dancers we saw moving through the palazzo, we also saw the figure of this woman. This is the actress Vanessa Myrie playing a character called Adriana, whose name comes from the mythical character after whom the Adriatic Sea is named. And in fact, the film opens with a scene of Myrie's Adriana gazing out at the ocean. Myrie's character is also a stand-in for a woman that the artist interviewed while researching Western Union small boats. She was one of the sole survivors of a boat tragedy in which more than 90 people were lost on a voyage from Libya to Sicily. Myrie's character of Adriana, though, is not a character in the sense of a narrative film, like you would expect, and this kind of backstory is not provided in or with the work itself. And really, it isn't needed, because this work speaks affectively rather than narratively, and poetically rather than didactically. So to explore this, let's return briefly to the dancers, seen here on the left and the right. Julian worked with the choreographer Russell Maliphant using dance as a metaphor for the movement or migration of people and the dancers' expressive bodies as alternatives to the masses of migrant bodies to which the media desensitizes us. The metaphor of the dance happens in dialogue with the architecture, just as the restaging of migrant corpses happened in dialogue with the seaside landscape. Julian's interventions into this grand Baroque architecture and the sun-drenched shores alike are intended to second guess what people might see as being incongruous to a space, calls into question assumptions about who belongs and who is displaced. So next we encounter the personal in Carlos Mota's 2017 work, The Crossing. This work is usually shown as a five to 11 channel installation which you can see here in a previous instantiation. For COVID health and safety reasons, we're presenting five of these videos on a loop on one screen. And now we'll go to Matterport and see them in situ. Okay, so here we are just outside Gibbons Gallery about to head in to see the work. In these interview-based videos, LGBTQI refugees tell their own stories of leaving their countries of origin in the Middle East and seeking asylum in the Netherlands, 
The setup of the gallery with one bench in front of the screen heightens a sense of intimacy between the viewer and the speaker who delivers their story, you can see looking directly at the camera and so seemingly directly at the viewer. So now let's watch a few short clips of one of the videos, the story of Butterfly. It was screened during an artist conversation hosted by Deniston Hill and the Daedalus Foundation. بهاللحظات انه لقينا قلم ست ساعات نحن انقطعنا بين الاقليم التركي والاقليم اليوناني، ست ساعات قاعدين تحت الشمس وما في كان طعام وما في شراب يعني الوسيله بس للحياه. ف يعني عانينا بالبلم كثير، المحرك رموه في البحر فصارت معاناه اكثر وصارت مشاجرات صرنا نجدد بايدينا وطبعا هيدا الشيء صورت له يعني انا صورت وعملت فيلم عليه يعني بعد هالاشياء اللي صارت معنا يعني بلوت في الله يعني ف سبحان يعني اجت ماي ايديا يعني اجت فكره لإلي يعني فطلعت الشنطه طبعا اوعينا شنطنا يعني رموهم في البحر بس انا كنت بحافظ على اشياء يعني شويه مكياج وهالاشياء الفكره تاعيتي مثلا انه كيف بدنا نلاقي حل ونحن بوسط البحر يعني لانه اغلبيته النساء فما عرفت لازم نعمل حل بالاخير اول الاشياء حاولت اهدي النساء يعني من حاله الستريس اللي عايشينها لانه في ناس خلص بدها تنتحر يعني تقع من البوت وما بيعرفوا يسبحوا فبدهم يموت انتهوا فخلص انا بلشت شوي اعمل دعابه بهالاشياء انه شيء طبيعي وكل الناس بتحصل سبحان الله يعني اجت الفكره انه بالمرايه طلعت مراية صغيرة ولعبت مرايتي في طبعا انعكاس الضوئي هيدا نحن اخذناه بالصف الاول وقت كنا اطفال على غفر السواحل اليوناني اتجاهي كان على غفر السواحل اليوناني فبعد ساعتين غفر السواحل اليونان انقذونا من هيدا الاشياء اللي لقيناها معاناة كان هدفي انا بدي نيوزيلاند يعني عم بعمل مستحيل بس لاسالها، اشوف ارضها، اشوف اللي انا بدي اياه، لاسال لانه انا حريتي، يعني انا اللي عانيته بمنطقتي يعني حاج كافي لايمت بدي اسرح عن نفسي واقول انه انا خلص ترانسجندر. We will watch a second clip from uh, just a short while later in the interview. وبعد 3 12 يوم تم تحويلي لكامب الفين اندراين لانه هون طبعا اثر علي بسلبيه كثير يعني شخصيتي ضعفت انا كثير قويه يعني وعندي شخصيه يعني لا مثال لها فلما شفت انه سجن انه ليه ليه يعني مثلا نحن ليه رايحين على السجن انا بعرف في شيء اسمه كامب ما بعرف في شيء اسمه سجن ف والموظفين يعني بالنسبه لل ال ب الفن اندراين مش موظفين كوا او هن سجانين كانوا سجانين ومتوظفوا بمجال انه هن كوا او يعني ما يعني منهم مختصين بهيك اشياء فكانت المعامله تبعيتهم مش يعني بعض منهم منيح بعض منهم لا يعني يعني بيعاملونا ك ذات الشيء انه انه شو ترانسجندر جيز يعني بعد هالاشياء ضليت سبع ايام ما اطلع من الاوضه يعني من غرفتي سبع ايام طبعا ما بعرف شو القوانين بالنسبه لهيدا الكام بس قبل بالصدفه يعني تعرفت على زميلي اللي كمان ترانسجندر حسيت انه فعلا انه اثنين افضل من واحد لانه الواحد شوي بكون مكسور لما شفت ترانسجندر ثاني مثلي قويت شوي افتر كمان شوي بعد يعني 15 يوم بلش اشوف ال جي بي تي يجوا لعنا فقويت اكثر واكثر حسيت انه عملنا شكل So the five videos that are included in the Cantor showing of uh, this work are the videos of Anwar, Butterfly, Renin, Benham, seen here, and Faisal. And I list those in the order in which they play on a loop in our gallery. 
Like Butterfly, each of these individuals narrate the experiences they faced before and after their immigration to Europe, how their LGBTQI identities impacted their decision or their need to leave their home of origin, their experiences en route, um, and their treatment in their adopted home of the Netherlands. And you saw that in Butterfly's video, both a recounting of her journey and a recounting of things that happened once she was in refugee centers in the Netherlands. Describing harrowing moments of struggle and survival quite often and complicated relationships to family and home. Here's a still of Anwar, who I personally find to have one of the most moving videos. Um, these portraits illuminate how persecution based on sexual and gender identity affects vulnerable migrant populations in particularly unique ways. This reality is significant to the artist, Carlos Mota, who identifies as a queer Colombian migrant and shares that he has often been, and this is a quote, made to feel as an undesired and threatening and foreign other. But regardless of his personal investment in this topic and any potentially shared experiences he may have with his subjects, it's important to note that as you saw in the clip of Butterfly's interview, neither the artist's image or his voice ever appear in the videos. Mota presents these stories as video portraits in which each subject, here is Renin, retains agency over the content, details, and delivery of their story. And you notice that they're all speaking in their um, first language. The formal composition of the film with the speaker completely centered and looking directly at the camera and us reinforces this sense of their agency. This kind of agency is not always afforded refugees during um, the process of their asylum seeking, or for that matter, in other kinds of media representation. In his video portrait, Faisal recounts the experience of having to try to prove his gayness to Dutch authorities. As you can see in this still from the video, the court responded, and more than once, that he just didn't seem gay. Because of this determination, Faisal faced the very real possibility that his petition for asylum would be denied and that he would be deported. Mota recalls an incidents during the production of this artwork when the veracity of one of the interviews was called into question. After much discussion and reflection, the artist ultimately decided not to do anything about that and present the interview as it had been delivered. Because here, the most important ethical dimension of the work is in the personal delivery of the interviews and the artist and the audience holding space for and believing the stories. The Netherlands has been one of the most progressive countries when it comes to LGBTQ rights. Um, and the nation represents itself as very thoroughly liberal. And many of the interviewees in this work are overjoyed to be there. Um, but issues around migration and asylum, Mota points out, have tested the limits of this. These interviewees recounting of their experiences in refugee centers housed in former prisons, as we heard with Butterfly, or navigating these sometimes arbitrary parameters, seeming gay, for qualifying for the protected class of LGBTQI are, of course, examples of this. So ultimately, these video portraits reveal the intersectionality of LGBTQI refugee experience, the complexities where asylum law collide with lived experience, and the ongoing search for ethical treatment, representation, and futures for LGBTQI asylum seekers. So finally, we've come to the political in Richard Moss's incoming. So here we are inside Russell Gallery. It's transformed for a black box theater for this work. If you're familiar with this gallery, it looks very different right now, doesn't it? The dark theater accentuates the extreme contrast of this three channel video work. And this extreme contrast is an inherent uh, feature of the kind of uh, video recording equipment that Moss is using. Creating this work between 2014 and 2017, Moss filmed using a thermal imaging camera, that is a camera that captures heat signatures. So next we'll watch a short clip so that you can see this aesthetic in action. And the clips that I'm going to show um, of this work are from a video prepared by the artist to be included in this virtual tour. 
and you can come and watch the whole um, hour long video there. Um, and so what you'll hear when I play these clips are the artist's explanations and comments over the audio track of the work itself. These initial scenes are really, it's a, it's a non-linear piece. It doesn't have a start or an end, but this is really, for me, where the piece starts. It doesn't really matter. You can come in at any point. But these scenes were shot over the city of Gaziantep, which is on the southern Turkish border with, with Syria. Um, it's a city where many Islamic State cells um, are, um, live and operate. And really what we're trying to do at this point, this is the dawn, is to, is to sort of confront the viewer or, or show the viewer how the camera sees. And we're looking into the sort of negative space of the sky. So looking at this clip, you might think that this film also takes a poetic approach to its subject matter. I mean, we were just looking at three uncanny pictures of the dawn sky. Um, but as you might have gleaned from Moss's commentary, he was specifically filming in locations where the political situation was active. Incoming was made in response to mass migration unfolding across Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa, and documents the journeys of refugees into Europe. In the clip, he was filming in Gaziantep, a border town affected by the activities of the Islamic State, recognized by the UN as a terror organization. You may also know this organization as ISIS or ISIL. Moss filmed in several kinds of locations for this work, border cities in Africa and the Middle East, on the Mediterranean Sea, and at refugee camps in Europe, focusing his camera on the refugees themselves as well as military activities and rescue activities. All the things that comprise what he refers to as the military humanitarian complex. So this border enforcement and rescuing of migrants in distress. So let's watch another clip filled on the USS Theodore Roosevelt aircraft carrier in the Persian Gulf. to work you can see that sweat literally articulated on the skin here um, that's what the camera really does to the to the human figure it, it sort of um, doesn't represent the individual it represents this um, you know this, this the organic biological trace the essence of, of our bodies really this this perspiration the respiration the uh, the, 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 the flow of blood beneath the skin um, all of that stuff is really brilliantly articulated by the camera, almost to the point of turning the individual almost into a kind of zombie monster, which is a disturbing aspect of the way it represents the individual. So this is the camera and what the camera does. We're letting the camera speak. The camera is mediating what we see. The camera, the camera becomes an author on some level. And this is very much our intention, is to reveal that to the viewer and to, and to sort of um, place the viewer into, into a, an ambiguous space. Um, here we're not representing refugees, we're representing the service men and women on the aircraft carrier who are carrying out, loading these missiles. This is a, this is a surveillance aircraft in the middle. Um, and that's, uh, I think, um, some sort of sidewinder missile on the, on the wing there. So the subject matter of that clip was military. And this uh, makes sense for my first choice of a uh, substantial clip because the camera that Moss is using was actually designed for military use, specifically for long range border surveillance and enforcement, battlefield situational awareness, tracking and targeting, as well as search and rescue. All of those things in that military humanitarian complex. And the camera can detect body heat from a distance of 18 miles during the day or night and as you've observed, um, it presents relative temperature difference through tonal contrast, resulting in these stark black and white images. Moss's intention in using this technology is to turn it against its intended purpose and instead shed light on the profoundly difficult and frequently very tragic journeys that many migrants make. In recasting this technology, um, Moss wants to challenge how photographic surveillance has weaponized the act of looking. He writes, we were trying to enter into its logic to foreground this technology of discipline and regulation and to create a work of art that reveals it. 
In doing so, Moss hopes to combat compassion fatigue, there's that phrase again, by quote unquote, keeping the heat literally on these urgent narratives of human displacement. But one of the sinister aspects of this technology and its inherent aesthetic is, as you heard Moss reflect on in that clip, that it distorts our view of human bodies, potentially making them appear monstrous. When this camera is turned on migrants and refugees, it's easy to imagine how this would be very dangerous, making it easier to treat them as a problem to be solved rather than as human beings. So we're gonna watch one more longer clip and in it, um, listen for the artist's further elaboration on the issue of this extreme aesthetic. So an image like this is extraordinary. And you know, I've never seen portraiture like this. And we're, we're shooting, because it's a very super telescopic field of view, it's very hard to create a, a, a traditional image with foreground, medium ground and, and, and distance background because we're looking through a telescope, literally. So Trevor has very artfully... Um, try to construct a more complex image by shooting through weeds like this, um, a slightly out of focus effect, cre creating a kind of tactility within the image. And um, um, so the, the visual language is such that uh, um, it's a much more compelling. But, but the image itself is, I, th I think, unique because it's, it's such a tender portrait. Um, and um, it's also invasive on some level. Um, because we're shooting, she's not really aware that we're there. There were a lot of photographers around in this particular uh, beach, um, but she didn't know she was being filmed. Yet, the camera doesn't identify her. So this is, is a slight, uh, slightly interesting thing that occurs, is the camera anonymizes the individual. Although it feels invasive um, and can be used in invasive ways, actually in this case, it's protecting that individual's identity. And many refugees, because they're regarded as doing something illegal, crossing illegally, even though they have human rights to, of a refugee behind them in international refugee law, they're still breaking the law according to host nations. And so many of them wish to remain um, anonymous. And so as any, any photographer who's tried to photograph the refugee crisis will tell you, this is the real dilemma. Do you, do you protect their identity and simply turn the camera off and walk away and not tell the story? Or do, you, or do you take the picture, risk identifying them to, to the immigration authorities and, and tell the story? And this camera allowed us to, to do that, to tell the story in, a, in a, I hope, a more adequate way, but without, without violating um, anyone's wish for, uh, to remain anonymous, uh, which is really, really important. So there is a complicated balance here in this work, a shifting between dangerous dehumanizing and protective anonymizing. And what a wealth of information um, from the artist himself in those clips. Moss has created a work that is aesthetically rich, yet as you can tell from some of these complicated issues that he's addressing, it's fraught with not only political, but also ethical implications. As Moss suggested in that last clip, the challenge for photojournalists and for artists like him is how to ethically photograph newsworthy situations of great political importance. When doing so, although um, permissible according to journalistic ethics or legally, um, when doing so could potentially violate the agency and um, you know, creative rights of individuals in vulnerable positions. Critics of the work have raised the question of whether this sinister technology can be anything but, whether it can be used for anything but sinister means. Um, and I'm reminded of the phrase, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So the political implications of this work are not only in what the artist seeks to reveal about the situation of refugees and asylum seekers and our nation's complicity in the military humanitarian complex, but also in how we as viewers may go forth to hold accountable our image makers, artists, photojournalists, documentarians, to challenge and advance criteria for ethical representation. So that concludes all the material that I've prepared for you. And now I would be really interested to um, hear any of your thoughts or answer any questions that you have. Um, I talked a little longer than I planned, but we've got about seven minutes to do that. 
Oh, okay. Oh, I've got a question. How long are each of these media pieces? Um, so Western Union Small Boats, the first one that we looked at is about 18 and a half minutes. Um, the crossing, each of the videos is between about nine and a half to 12 and a half um, minutes. And so the loop of five videos as we've presented it is 57 and a half minutes. And incoming, the work that we just saw clips of, um, is 52 and a quarter minutes. So some of them are quite long, um, which is another reason that doing an event like this um, is fun because you get to dive in deeper. It's unlikely, we don't expect all of our visitors to spend 50 minutes um, watching just one work. Although if you'd like to, please do. Um, so these will be on view through May 30th. Um, please come in. We've got about five weeks of the museum being open for this show on view. And I really hope that if you're able, please do come in and see them because the work is really impressive to see in person. Let's see, question, what would you say was one of the biggest challenges in installing these works at the Cantor? That is such a great question. Um, so the Cantor's building, it's a neoclassical style building, the main part of it made out of thick concrete walls, um, you know, designed in partnership with Leland Stanford himself. And so um, we've got a lot of historic materials in the building, including some of our um, ceilings. And so hanging things like projectors um, was a little bit of a challenge, both figuring out how to hang them in spaces that might have historic ceilings um, or just avoiding various important things that are in the ceiling. Um, so, of course, the aesthetics and how to figure out how to put these large, massive, impressive works within the context of the exhibition was challenging, but the physical was the most challenging aspect, I, th I would say. Great questions. Um, oh, here's a nice one. Does any one of these pieces speak more to you than the other two? Um, I want to say no, because I love them all, but um, I have to say that it's changed over time. When I first saw the works, um, I was really enamored with Richard Moss's Incoming. It's really a hard hitting work. Um, and I love that really extreme aesthetic. And it's when you hear it in person, the volume of the soundtrack is quite loud and reverberating, which is um, really impressive. But spending more time with the works, reading, getting to know each of them more deeply. Um, I started to really like Isaac Julian's um, Western Union Small Boats because it also has a really moving soundtrack. Um, it's such that you, you sit in the space in that blue theater and you feel the soundtrack in your body. You can kind of feel rolling waves or you can feel the reverberation of um, ship bells and things like that. Um, so the complexity and the the poetry of the sound and the visuals in the Isaac Julian really grew on me while we were doing the installation. Carlos Mota's The Crossing, I think for me might be one of the most, if not the most important of the three video works um, because it lets the interviewees speak and tell their own stories. And I think that that is, um, you know, it removes the artist in some way, and we don't often see that in quite this way, but I think it's really important thing that um, we're all going to have to exercise this kind of, um, this kind of practice of making space for and elevating stories of others without interjecting our own, our own feelings. Um, all right. The thermal technology used by Moss makes reality look so unfamiliar. It's jarring and unsettling. Yeah, absolutely. And it's um, it's interesting because he can switch it on the camera whether light um, whether light indicates heat or cold, and you know, or whether dark does. And so there are more than one scene where we kind of go back and forth between the two schemes. Um, and it's like very jarring because all of a sudden you see um, ghostly people or a, a 
hot air jet, a black hot air jet. And then, you know, in the other scene, it's flipped around. Um, so it is, it's really quite uncanny. Great. Could you talk about how you made the choice to include certain artworks, narrowing down the pieces with a focus on European migration? That's a great question. So this is a traveling exhibition. And so um, we're the third venue. And so these three works are ones that were part of the original checklist um, of Ava Respini and Ruth Erickson at ICA Boston. So you'd have to ask them exactly how they narrowed down the focus. But if you look at all of the works in the exhibition, and there's over 40 um, artworks, unique artworks in the show, you see that they did a, they must have done a really, really conscientious job of looking at um, the focus of the work, um, both in terms of where people, where migrants started off in their journey and where they've ended up. So there's a number of works that are focused on um, migration to the US, for instance, um, in contrast to these three. Um, so I think it's just a sort of a coincidence that these particular three media works are focused on immigration into Europe. Great question. Um, if we've got any last questions, feel free to drop it in the chat. I'm going to share my screen one more time um, because we are coming up on the last minute or two of this program. Um, so here are image credits, the media clips that I showed. Um, and I wanna say thank you for attending tonight's virtual tour of these time-based media artworks and when home won't let you stay. And we look forward to seeing you again soon in person in the galleries at last and uh, get your time tickets, link in the chat. Um, or we hope to see you at our upcoming virtual events. If you're a Stanford student, we hope you'll join us for a conversation with Carlos Mota, who we just saw his work today. Um, and more information will be forthcoming on that on our website. And we also invite you to come by our website. Yay! We've updated the exhibition website with even more interesting and informative content, highlighting the artworks exclusive to our presentation, and also recommending further reading on California's histories of migration and diversity. And you can also find on our website recordings of previous exhibition-related events, including our artist conversation from February with Isaac Julian, um, whose work you also saw today. And um, I believe we might be dropping a link in the chat. There it is. So um, thank you again for coming tonight. And I hope you enjoyed hearing about these awesome works as much as I enjoyed talking about them.